Hello again, everybody. We're having another screencast lecture today. The topic for today is human genetics, and we're going to kick this one off with a discussion about the gender of a human baby. And that's a real common question. Obviously, you probably have heard that, like when uh, somebody has a new baby, people say, hey, is it a boy? Is it a girl? Um, let's talk about how that is determined genetically. A uh, quick flashback, we know about the two sex cells, the male sperm cell provides 50% of the genetic material, the female egg cell provides the other 50% of the chromosomes for the offspring, and you get something that looks like this. So when you have a fertilized egg, yeah, when you have a baby, um, you get something that looks like this. This is the mapping of all 23 pairs of chromosomes, so you can look at this, and you can see pair 1, pair 2, pair 3, etc., etc., and if you take a look at this, we'll blow this up, get a little closer look at it. We'll see most of these chromosomes in the pairs are roughly equal in length to the to its uh, to its pair. So those are all roughly equal in length. And if you take a look at the 23rd pair, however, you may notice on this one that this chromosome is significantly longer than the second chromosome. And this is that 23rd pair, this 23rd pair of chromosome is the pair of chromosomes that's going to determine the gender of the baby. So is it going to be a boy? Is it going to be a girl? Let's take a look at what happens here. So the parents, here's daddy, here's mommy, and the dad in the 23rd chromosome pair is going to have this. He's going to have one X chromosome, that's the longer chromosome. He's going to have one Y chromosome, that's a shorter chromosome, and the mom is going to have this chromosome, this X chromosome, and another X chromosome. So the dad is missing part of this chromosome here that the mom has, so it, it doesn't have the certain information that the uh, mom is going to get. And when we have a certain sperm, the sperm is going to come in, we have this one has all of these chromosomes, this one has all of these chromosomes, this one has that shortened chromosome in the 23rd pair, this one has the long chromosome in the 23rd pair, they, that's often called the X chromosome, and sometimes this is, will be referred to as the Y chromosome. And so if the dad, and again this is a 50% chance, if the dad gives this chromosome, the mom is going to give one of these chromosomes, so the dad in this case is giving one of the long chromosomes, that's that X chromosome, the mom is always going to give an X chromosome, because she only has an X or an X, that will give either an X or a Y. In this case the dad gives an X chromosome, mom gives an X chromosome, and the child is going to be XX, and that is going to be a girl, yay! Congratulations. Now if the sperm is this one, where it has the Y chromosome in the 23rd pair, so the dad is not going to give the X chromosome. In this case, the dad is giving the Y chromosome. The mom, again, is given an X or an X. And so there's one Y chromosome, one X chromosome. The child will then be a boy. Yay! Congratulations. So determining gender goes like this. Here's a female. This is that 23rd pair of chromosomes. Either the female is going to give an X or an X. The male will give either an X or a Y. So you should be able to figure out this Punnett square. Go ahead and do it to yourself real quick. XX or XX down here. What will this be? Hopefully you said XY. And down here, again, XY. So what is the percent chance of having a female offspring? This is a female offspring, this is a female offspring. So the chance is 50%. So two out of the four ch chances are female. So, uh, so which parent is actually going to determine the gender of the offspring? Is it going to be the mommy or the daddy? Well, it's going to be the father, because the father's either going to give an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. The mom is always going to give an X chromosome. Uh, you, you may recognize this, this fellow here. This is King Henry VIII, and he's kind of well known for having several wives. Uh, he divorced a few, and unfortunately, some even had their 
uh, heads cut off, they were executed, like you may have heard of Anne Boleyn, she's probably the most famous, and she was actually executed. One of the reasons why he wanted a new, another wife is that he wasn't having a male child, he wanted a boy, he wanted a male heir, and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, was not able to do that. He, she did have a baby girl, but she never did have a son for him uh, that survived, and so he wanted to get another wife, and Anne Boleyn, she had a daughter, Okay, which is good. That's Queen Elizabeth. You might have heard of her. And she, um, unfortunately, was not able to have a uh, baby boy that survived, and then so on and so forth. Uh, eventually did get to have a son, but he he was king for a little while, but he didn't last too long. So really, and, and it's interesting about it, I think the irony about it is that it turns out Henry VIII is really the one who's at fault because the male, the father, is going to determine if the child is going to be a boy or a girl. All right, let's move on. So genetic complications, diseases, and disorders. Now, one of the things about sexual reproduction, one of the things we mentioned is that there is a greater chance of some sort of complications or mutations, things like that, that can happen as compared to asexual reproduction. And this, uh, here, here's one of the cases. So if we take a look at this, here is the mapping out of the chromosomes of a human. And if you take a look at this, you should probably be able to figure out if this is a boy or a girl. And if you look down here, the 23rd pair of chromosomes, this is a boy or a girl. Hopefully you said boy, because we have an X, that longer chromosome, and one Y chromosome, the shorter chromosome. And let's take a look at this. And if you look closely, you should be able to see something that looks unusual. Go ahead and take a minute, if you want to pause it, because I'm going to tell you here in a second what the answer is. Okay. Well, if you look here on the 21st pair, you'll notice there are actually three chromosomes, and there's only supposed to be two. So there's an extra chromosome that got stuck, and every time the, the cells reproduce, it's going to copy this extra chromosome. So all the new cells are going to be made with the extra chromosome. And again, this one's still a boy, by the way. See, one X chromosome, one shorter Y chromosome. And this t extra chromosome, the third chromosome uh, in the 21st pair, this would cause what's known as Down syndrome. And you may be familiar with this, like from the uh, some of the kids in the learning center. Here's a uh, uh, another child. This is a female child, Down syndrome child. And let's take a look at this. Here's a clip that you may find of local interest, because I actually know this person. Story. A Dayton toddler with Down syndrome is slowly becoming the poster child across the nation for kids with the disorder. Wale Aliu introduces us to 16-year-old Joy Minor. Meet 16-month-old Joy Minor, if you haven't already. She's the face on a couple toys from Infantino's Everybody Plays campaign available at Target. She's also modeled for Sweet Petunia clothing and done photo and commercial shoots with Dayton Children's Hospital. But these national modeling contracts are not what keeps her smiling. Joy is really cheerful around me when I just get home from school. She's like, bah, bah! She's like, she loves to clap. Well, I think anytime talking about your hopes and dreams for your child, just like anybody's hopes and dreams, it's, it's emotional. We want the best for her. And today, Intel has put up this billboard for the Buddy Walk, and you'll notice the face of the billboard is Joy. She's really shown, you know, everyone within the Down syndrome community that we can do anything. You know, our kids can do whatever they want. You know, people can learn from us. So she's our poster child, you know, on all the billboards and, and everywhere. So we're very excited to have her. Um, be part of our community. The Buddy Walk happens every year at Fifth Third Field to promote awareness and inclusion for people with Down syndrome. The money made from the walk helps offset costs for 200 families in the Miami Valley who have a child with the disorder. Being a big brother is kind of hard and frustrating and very cool too. The chromosome and their body and they're, they're just like us. They want to be happy. They want to have fun. In Dayton, Wale Aliu, ABC 22 News. We're back. Uh, let's take a look at this one. Now, take a look at this mapping and see if you can find something unusual about this one. If you look at the 21st chromosome pair, you notice that there's two of them there, so this person does not have Down syndrome. See if you can catch something else. I'll pause. Or you'll pause. Because I'm going to tell you the answer right now. Okay, take a look at here. You actually have one, two, three chromosomes. Now it's in the 23rd pair. 
you can have an extra chromosome in any of these pairs. Sometimes it's actually, however, though, if there's an extra chromosome a certain, in a certain pair, the uh, baby will never be able to survive. So, uh, however, in this case, this, this child did survive. Um, they have one, two, three chromosomes, two X's and one Y. This is, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's Kleinfelter syndrome. And one of the things about this, uh, some of the characteristics of Kleinfelter syndrome is often the, the person will be a boy. And sometimes they'll be a little taller than average. Uh, sometimes they'll be thinner, like skinnier than, uh, than average. Um, and oftentimes they will be uh, sterile. They will not be able to have children of their own. All right, a blank screen. And next, here's another one. See if you can spot the problem in this one. Go ahead and pause because here comes the answer. Okay, right here, you'll notice that in the fifth chromosome pair, there is a broken chromosome. So there's a longer chromosome, and this one is not as long as this one. A piece of this chromosome was broken off, and when it was copied, it was copied as a broken chromosome. So all of the cells are going to carry this uh, broken pair of chromosomes where you don't have all of that uh, genetic information. So there's something missing there. And this would be called Cryduchat syndrome, and that kind of stands for in French for cats cry and here's a clip to give you an idea of why it might be called that yeah. those are things that just happened however there are some uh, diseases disorders that can be inherited genetically let's take a look at some of that so color blindness. Color blindness is one that's uh, fairly common. So if you take a look over here on the left, this is supposed to be like what normal uh, colored sight would look like. So most of us will see colors here, like you'll see this is blue, this is yellow, this is green. And someone over here who is colorblind, like our good buddy Y guy, who is colorblind. So he, where are you? I, I don't know. I, I can't show it on the screen right now. But uh, he may see something that looks a bit like this. Can you tell that these are two different photos? Do they look different to you? This side versus this side? Do they, do they look different? Say they look the same. Yes. Yeah. So that's because Y guy is colorblind. Thanks. You can go now. Bye. <laughs> and there's not just one type of colorblindness. So. These three look the same except this one. Okay, so to Y guy, these three look the same. Uh, to you and I, if we have normal vision, this one looks different than this one, and definitely looks different from this one. This one looks different to Y guy, but these three look the same. So color blindness, it's just a different way to see things. It's not that you don't see any color at all. Yeah, well, well, yeah, it says normal, but they, they, it's interesting that you said they all three look the same. I think that's actually really interesting for our viewers. Over here, we again, we have uh, two different color palettes. Uh, does this look the same as this? Do these look the same, this side and this side? Which, which ones look different? Do these two look the same? Okay. So this one's a little bit darker. What color do you think that is? That's red. Okay, red. What, what, is, what is this? That's green. Okay. So why guy sees this as green. What about this? That's yellow. Yellow. What about this? Black. That's okay. Just that's guess. That's gray and that's another green. <coughs> okay. So this looks, gray and orange. this looks gray and orange. Uh, this, what about this one? Cool. Purple. Okay, pink. And this one, okay. Okay, so pink and blue. So you can see the Y guy uh, perceives colors by a little bit different than you and I, and that's okay. Uh, you can do everything just fine. Let's take a look at a clip of this. It's a pretty neat clip. I think you're going to like it about what it's like to be colorblind. See you in a bit. It's not that I can't see colors. I can see most colors, but it's that certain colors fade into what I would call indistinct. The analogy I always use is that if you have a pack of 36 colored pencils, I, uh, I can only see maybe 12 shades of those colored pencils. We're trying to do those dot tests where they have the different numbers and it's like in a different color. But trying to do these, everyone will be like, oh, it's a seven, oh, it's a 62. I'd be like, there's, you're, li you're all lying. Apparently there's one with a sailboat and I've never seen it. I play soccer. It may affect me on the field. Our team is purple 
and the other team was a different shade of purple, uh, and I passed to the other team two times. Uh, I'll often be shopping for something and just go up to a stranger and ask them, is this black or is this navy blue? Is this red or orange? That kind of thing. Like you can tell right here, I'm wearing a green sweater, but if you start like asking me like, what shade of green? I'm the worst at it. So the stop, don't go hand for crossing the street and the walk time to go, I see the hand is red and I always thought that the man was green. Just be, that that's a context clue thing where I was like, oh, okay, one's red, one must be green. But someone told me that uh, the man crossing the street is, is white. I like to think that I have some sort of like um, advantage by having a disadvantage. I suppose I may be missing out on things. I guess I don't know what I'm, I'm missing out on. And it's kind of cool too because I don't view it, view it as very limiting, but then when people are just always so intrigued by like, what is this? Like, how does it even work? Do I only see like black and white, like a TV show? Or is it, you know, which is not true. Like last night, my friend asked me, I was like, I'm doing this interview about color blindness. And he goes, what color is the couch? And it's, it's bright red. Because <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of annoying when when people are like oh well, what is this and it's it's not that big of a deal. All right, now that we know a little bit about color blindness and some of you in the viewing viewing audience may be color blind as well, let's uh, talk about how one becomes color blind and how you get that genetically. So how does a child get color blindness? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the dad. Here's the dad. The dad has his X chromosome. We're talking about this 23rd pair, so it's on that that sex chromosome pair right over here. So here's the X chromosome. Here's his Y chromosome. Here's mom's X chromosome. Shh. Hey, 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 come on. I got to quit, quit interrupting, please. All right. You did a good job, though. Thank you. Thanks for helping with that. Okay, we got the X chromosome and the X chromosome over here from mom. Neither parent are colorblind. So both of these parents, dad and mom, can see colors normally, as we would call it. So like most of us can see colors, red, green, blue, orange, yellow. They can see their colors just fine. Now, the mom is what's known as what's called a carrier. Her dad was colorblind, and she received, ah, oh, thank you, uh, she received one allele for colorblindness, one x-axis for colorblindness. Her other x uh, chromosome, I said x-axis, x, -axis, x uh, chromosome is not colorblind, so normal sight. Dad has an x chromosome with normal sight, and he has a y chromosome, but notice that down here, this is where that trait is for down here you see the uh, on the X chromosome this part down here this is the information for uh, color sight for normal color sight or for color blindness so dad doesn't even have this piece right here so he just has one allele for normal color blind, uh, normal color sight so he can see fine mom has one for normal color and one for color blindness and fortunately for mom color blindness is a recessive trait so the the uh, fact that she has one allele for normal color sight means that she's going to be able to see normal color. Now here's where it gets a little more interesting, is mom and dad is going to give one allele. So if dad gives the Y chromosome, that smaller chromosome, mom gives the X chromosome, this is the one without color blindness. What is, first of all, what's going to be the gender of this offspring? Is it going to be a boy or a girl? Hopefully you said boy, because you have one X chromosome, one Y chromosome, that's a boy. And is it going to be colorblind? Well, you look at it, there's no genotype at all for colorblindness, so no. This is going to not be a colorblind boy. This is going to be a normal sighted boy. And But what if the dad gives that, that Y chromosome and mom gives the other X chromosome? Now, this is the one that carries that, that uh, colorblindness trait. This is going to be a boy or a girl. Well, yeah, it's going to be a boy or a girl, but what is it going to be? Is it going to be a boy? Is it going to be a girl? Well, again, this is going to be a boy. Is this boy going to be colorblind? Well, you look up here, it has one colorblind gene, and it, that's all it has. So it has that one recessive colorblind gene, so yeah, that's all it has. It's going to be colorblind. So this boy is going to be a colorblind child. Now, what if the dad, though, gives the X chromosome, and mom gives that colorblind X chromosome. First of all, is this going to be a boy? Is this going to be a girl? You should say it's a girl. Hopefully you said that because you have XX. This is going to be a girl. Is this girl going to be colorblind? Well, it does have the one colorblind gene, but remember that's recessive and it has one normal color sight, so this is 
dominant. So that this, is, this girl is not going to be colorblind. She's going to be able to see uh, color normally. However, she is still going to be a carrier. So she'll uh, be able to pass it on to her, her children. Now let's say we have an actual colorblind dad. So the, this male is colorblind. And mom gets remarried to a different guy, this good-looking fellow here. He is colorblind. And they have a child. This time the male, let's go back to this one, the male gives this X chromosome that has the color blindness, and mom gives the X chromosome that has the color blindness. This is going to be a boy. Is this going to be a girl? Well, XX is a girl. This is going to be a girl. Is she going to be colorblind? The answer now is yes, because she has those. She has both recessive traits. She has both recessive colorblind genes, and no dominant normal genes. So this is going to be a female who is colorblind, and that's extremely rare. And you can see why, because I mean it has to be very specific circumstances. The dad has to be colorblind, and the mom has to be colorblind, or at least a colorblind carrier. Otherwise, the girl's not going to be colorblind. And that brings us to something called a pedigree, and let's pause to have a drink of orange juice. We are now, we are really not drinking soda anymore, so. Ah, uh, yep, Diet Dr. Pepper had a chance, and they dropped a ball and did not support us, so now we're drinking orange juice. Now we're supported by orange juice that we made at home. All right, pedigree. Let's take a look at a pedigree. A pedigree shows traits and inheritances through several generations, and you may have heard of pedigrees like through dogs or cats, things like that. Okay, so here is that uh, dad with, who is not colorblind. Here's that mom who's a colorblind carrier, and they have a child. They have a girl who has non-colorblind and colorblind. So this is going to be a non-colorblind girl, but she is a carrier. That means that she has that gene, and she can pass it on to a child. It could be shown but like this. Now the box, the square, represents the guy. So guys are square. And the woman, the female, is going to be represented by a circle. And that circle is going to be halfway filled in because she is a carrier, but she is not affected. The male has nothing. It is not colored in because he is not affected. He does not have the colorblind gene at all. Now if they have a daughter, if they have a girl... This, that, the, uh, the female gave her X chromosome that had the colorblind gene. The male gave the X chromosome that is not colorblind. And so this girl is not going to be colorblind, but she is a carrier. So she can end up passing on that gene to her future children. This setup, where we have the X chromosome with colorblindness, the X chromosome with colorblindness, both of those come together. And this pedigree can be shown like this. You see it's a little bit different. First of all, the square the square represents the male, and that's filled in because he is affected. He is colorblind. The female is a circle that's halfway filled in because she is a female. That's why it's round. And it's half filled in because she is a carrier, but she is not colorblind. She's not affected. And then their daughter will get an affected chromosome, X chromosome from dad, and will get a colorblind chromosome from mom. And now she's a girl, and she is actually did she is actually colorblind because she got both the X chromosomes with colorblindness from one from each of her parents. All right, let's take a look at this. So now, if they have multiple children, this shows colorblind dad square, uh, carrier mom, and they can have children. So they had how many daughters? Hopefully, you said two because there's one here, one here. Those are both female, and sons. There are two sons, one, two. And how many of their children are actually colorblind, who are affected? Well, this girl is affected. She is colorblind. This male is affected. He is colorblind. This male is unaffected. He cannot pass colorblindness on to his children. This female is unaffected, but she is a carrier, so she can pass colorblindness on to her child. Here's a little colorblind test. Now, surprisingly, I've had students, uh, more than one now, who have come, who did not, never knew they were colorblind until they came to this class and saw this lecture, and they realized that they uh, were colorblind. So if you take a look at this, you should be able to see a number in there. We'll let you, uh, okay, so we're going to have Y guy, he's going to try this out and see how well this works for somebody who's affected. 
Okay, whoa, you got... Gross. Here, let's wipe your face. Yogurt? Okay, at least you're eating healthy. Okay, so what? do you see a number in this? No. No, okay. The number is 45 for those of us. Yeah. See, 45. Whoa. Now you see it, probably. Okay, do you see this number? 12. Hey, good. Do you see a number here? Eight. Uh, five. That's five. Do you see one here? Nope. Okay, that's 74. And that's color blindness. And you can show this. This is like a pedigree kind of thing. I'm yeah, you did, you did pretty good. You got that one. I'm not colorblind? No, you're colorblind, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, see ya. Thanks for playing. So here you see the unaffected father. Again, X and Y chromosomes. Mother is X chromosome, X chromosome. She is a carrier. This blue is the affected. She is a carrier. She is not colorblind. She can pass on either an X chromosome without it or an X chromosome with it. And in this case, she passed on the X chromosome to this boy, so he is affected. He is colorblind. Uh, this son is not affected, unaffected, unaffected daughter. This is a carrier daughter. She is not colorblind, but she can pass it on to her children. And this boy is actually going to be colorblind. So this is like Y guy right here. Okay, let's take a look at this. So now we have a colorblind father. This father is colorblind. This mother is unaffected. She's not a carrier. So can the sons be colorblind? Answer is no, because if you take a look, the father, if he's going to have a son, he passes on this chromosome, which does not have that trait for colorblindness or normal sight. So whatever he passes on to the son is not going to have colorblindness on there. The mother is not colorblind, okay, so she's going to pass on uh, a normal sight, normal sight, so normal sight here, normal sight here, son, normal sight, this son gets normal sight, the mother gets this one, which is normal sight, this son is unaffected, the father is always going to pass on this X chromosome if he's going to have a daughter, which has the trait, so his daughter here is going to have this one, and then one of the mothers is going to give this one. So the daughter is going to be a carrier, this daughter, and then this daughter is going to be a carrier. So no matter what, if the father is colorblind, his daughters are going to be carriers. They'd have to be a carrier. All right, here's another uh, disorder that can be passed on. This is called cystic fibrosis, and this is a recessive disorder. So what that means is that to have to be affected by cystic fibro by fibrosis, you must get that, that trait from both your mom and your dad. So if you just get it from your mom, okay, just get it from your mom, just get it from your mom, you're okay. All right, you're, you do not have cystic fibrosis because it's a recessive trait. However, you can pass it on to your children. Um, to be able to, to have cystic fibrosis, you would have to get it from the father, and from the mother. So both of those genes must be uh, for cystic fibrosis, uh, both recessive genes to be able to be an affected daughter for cystic fibrosis. Another kind of little history lesson. This is Tsar Nicholas of Russia. He was the king of, of Russia and up until the very early 1900s in right during uh, World War One when the communists, if you ever heard of the Soviet Union, when the communists overthrew, oh no, thank you. I don't, I don't like cookies, thank you. Uh, the, the communists uh, overthrew the czar, the king, and uh, set up the Soviet Union, the communist government. So maybe you'll learn about that in school somewhere. If not, read about it, it's pretty interesting. But you have a pedigree here with some pretty famous names. You may have heard of Queen Victoria, she was the Queen of England. Hi, and she, is a carrier for a disease called hemophilia, which which is Queen Victoria. She's not in this picture, but she is a uh, a carrier for something called hemophilia. And hemophilia is is if you look at the root words, it's like fear of blood. Um, you know, the, the person who has this is not afraid of blood, but their blood cl does not clot nearly as quickly as a uh, uh, unaffected person would be. No, that's bad. So their blood clot 
uh, their blood does not clot nearly as quickly as somebody who's unaffected. So if you get a cut on your hand, usually it's not a big deal. You don't worry about it. You, you clean it. You wash it. And eventually it's going to scab over. It's going to clot. It's going to scab over. But if you have hemophilia, that you're, you will bleed quite a bit more. It's going to take much, much longer for that, that, that scab to set up and to stop the bleeding. So you have to be extra careful if you get a cut so you don't uh, bleed too much. So anyways, Queen Victoria... Uh, they had a daughter, and she was a carrier, so she was did not have hemophilia. Her and her husband had a child, and she had a, she had a daughter. Her name is Alexandra, and that's her right here. And she was a carrier as well. Again, you can see the circle and the half uh, filled in circle. That means she's a carrier. Tsar Nicholas of Russia is right here. That's her husband. They got married. They had several children. These are all their children here. You can see one, two, three, four girls and a boy. And his name was Alexei. And he got the disease from the mother, and he is affected. So he had hemophilia. If you've ever seen this movie, this is a Disney movie. It's called Anastasia. This is kind of about that, where one of these girls, I don't know which one it is. I'm going to guess her. Um, one of the girls, they claimed, see, all, unfortunately, all these all these guys were killed. I mean, they were murdered. Um, but the the story was that one of them escaped and didn't get, get executed. And that's what this is about, this cartoon, a Disney cartoon. I saw it. I don't really know what exactly happened. I don't remember. It was several years ago I saw it. Uh, this is a fella. His name is Rasputin. And as far as I know, he looks like a bad guy here in this Disney movie. But apparently, uh, he apparently um, was good friends with the mom because he seemed to be able to keep the young boy from uh, getting sick and helped his uh, blood clot and things like that. So she liked him. His name was Rasputin. Another interesting character. So here's... Uh, the boy right here, a picture of the boy and his father, and he had a hemophilia. Here's a few clips, just kind of shows uh, the young man uh, in real life what he looked like. I just thought it was kind of interesting. I love history and this kind of thing. You can see this one's dated 1913, so I believe it was 1917, maybe 1918, when they were executed, so in about three to four years. So here, here's the deal. So the father did not have hemophilia. The mother was a carrier. And the problem is, is that this is kind of like color blindness, where it's carried on that uh, 23rd chromosome, the, the, the sex chromosome. But it's kind of said of something like that's not a huge deal, like color blindness. The uh, mother passed on the trait of hemophilia to the son, which was a big deal. And here's one of the reasons why this kind of happens. This is a pedigree. This is a big pedigree. And the... Uh, uh, this this is the royal family. What's interesting is that at the time in Europe, uh, most of the, the kings and queens and such, they were related to each other. Here's one of the reasons. If you take a look at this pedigree, you have the royalty of, of Europe, like uh, England, Germany, Russia. These guys are all related, cousins, uh, you know, marrying other cousins, etc. And what you get is you get a, a, a lack of genetic diversity is what we've talked about, how that could be a problem. And so the odds of getting a certain disease like this, a genetic passed on disease, is much, much higher. So if you take a look, we have just in this family, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So ten of these boys all were affected as hemo uh, hemophilia. Um, and, uh, you know, none of the girls, but they could be carriers uh, in this case. One, two, three, four, five, six. And some of these names you may have heard of over here. Queen Victoria of England, you may have heard of her. And she had several children. So the ones that come branching off right here. So she had a daughter, Alice. Um, she had a son here, which is Edward the Seventh. He was the king of England. Um, here's another daughter, Victoria. Here's a son, Arthur, it looks like, Leopold. Is that King Arthur? Uh, no, it is not King Arthur. Um, over here, Beatrice, um, and, so, and so on and so forth. The more related people are, the greater the chances are that some of these, these genes will, will be in their family. Like here, for example, is Tsar Nicholas on the left and King George V on the right. So they look almost like twins. They're not. They're closely related, as you saw through that, that pedigree we just took a look at. Now, here's something to keep in mind that I think this is a really important kind of idea and 
uh, quote that our, although our genetic structure greatly influences our lives, it does not determine our future. So we get a lot of our traits from our genes. However, it doesn't determine everything. So you may think, oh, well, I didn't get, you know, really great genes or I got great genes so I could just skate through life. You know, that, that's not really true. So there's other in, in, impacts on how we develop and grow and things like that. Environmental influences can have a large impact. Uh, diet, exercise, exposure to toxins, um, like carcinogens could make you get sick and have cancer. Um, if you're taking certain medications, that might stunt your growth or they may help you to grow, things like that. So there's all different kinds of things besides just your genes that will determine uh, how tall you are and things like that. So, and here's uh, a couple guys here. Again, another little history lesson. You got, you got these guys, their names Watson and Crick. They were the ones who discovered DNA. We could see, um, we're not going to watch this now, but we will take a look at this in the classroom. It's a real nice video about genetic counselor and what a genetic counselor can do is if a family is concerned about that they may have like a, uh, some of these genetic diseases in their family, they could they can uh, take a look at what are the chances are that they'll have children and pass on those uh, genetic uh, diseases onto their children. So that's a genetic counselor. Well, that's all we got for tonight. So uh, hope everything goes well. Hopefully this makes some sense. Please comment down below uh, if you have any questions. Hopefully you give us a thumbs up. Hopefully this lecture is helpful, and we will see you next time. See ya. Bye.